in order to make a reduction strategy, you have to have an accurate and auditable data set. I worked with Mike when I was at the, uh, my other previous company. Met with him as a contractor, where he showed me his Venn Medic unit, and I got really interested in what he was doing with it, and the concept and the vision that he had for it. So that kind of really inspired me to kind of join and work with Mike. And then we'll start the job. A carbon credit is the reduction of a one ton of CO2 equivalent of methane emissions. If you get an accurate baseline measurement of your emissions and you reduce those emissions, that's called a carbon offset. You're making a better a change for the atmosphere that is a net benefit. So therefore you will get a carbon credit for that. It sounds odd, but the more your wellhead leaks, the more you stand to make in terms of carbon credits. Once you cut and cap or plug and abandon as it's known in the United States, once that happens and you prove that you've taken that emission to zero, you can put those um, calculations on the voluntary carbon market and uh, hopefully buyers will bid on that and uh, buy your carbon credit. Being in the industry for 25 years, testing these wellhead emissions, I knew the potential for inaccuracy was there. The accountability and the audit trail, I think are a large part of people's successes. Because as we've seen in Canadian media, there is huge discrepancies in our GHG reporting. In so much that, you know, Bill C-59 is called a, a greenwashing bill. Well, the reason you kind of um, want a report or don't want to report is the accuracy of the report. When it's on a, a federal scale and you're estimating, you should not be reporting the, to the public because is the reduction actually happening? Well, I guess by my estimation, it is. That's not the right way to do it when people are paying taxes on things like carbon tax or carbon emissions. I am endeavoring to do is to accurately measure those emissions. Alberta Energy Regulator Directive 87 mandates annual surface casing vent flow testing, but even that directive allows producers to not report their emissions after they have done sequential testing over a five or six year period. So they don't even need to report those emissions if they've done them and there's been no change after a set time. Why is this been going on? Honestly, low flows are very hard to accurately uh, measure. The technologies of the day that they mandate are a household positive displacement meter, which is that essentially that gray analog box that's on the side of everybody's houses. The problem with that is the Positive displacement meter, in order to measure, needs a quarter pound of line pressure. Well, as you emit to the atmosphere, you don't often have 0.25 PSI to actually make the meter work. So anything below that pressure the makes renders that meter ineffective and very inaccurate. Being that the meter is analog, there's no data trail of the emissions venting to atmosphere. That's a technology that was mandated in 1999. They don't have the ability to be recorded in an accurate way. They're written on a piece of paper and then somebody has to go do data entry. Sometimes that data can get lost. Sometimes the data entry is not put into the database accurately. It's not put in at a certain time period or it's put in late. So then that, that well or the program gets missed and pushed to the next year. In order to uh, successfully get approval to abandon a well in Alberta, the operator, uh, after they remediate or try to fix a venting leak, so to stop the emissions from atmosphere, they're asked to do a, a 10 minute bubble count. The bubble in the cup concept is you attach onto the surface casing vent, you get one inch of water and you put the hose into the, the water and you see and you count how many bubbles uh, come into the cup. And it's, it's written so the, the methodology there, A, lends itself to no audit trail and no emissions accuracy. Because bubbles could be uh, at a rate, say, like a pot of macaroni on your stove boiling. Or they could be 
bubbles the size of Coca-Cola bubble. So there's no reference to the size of the bubble, yet the regulator asks that if there is any bubbles present in the water, you cannot abandon that well. So what it does is it just invites people not to be accurate or honest with their interpretation of what a bubble is or the bubble count is. It gets in as a standard and then it's really hard to change that standard, right? And when new technology comes in, it's kind of hard for people to adopt new technology. A, because it's new, then there's the cost to the technology, whereas opposed to the standard bubble in a cup, it's cheap and easy to do, right? It's more of a detection method than any kind of a measurement method. And I think if we're really trying to reduce our emissions, you can't detect or count a bubble. You should therefore use the tools and the technology that are out there to represent what is actually going on. Every oil and gas producer that I talk to values their sustainability report, yet they don't go that extra distance to accurately report their emissions when they abandon a well. They know that their methods are antiquated. And I think if they actually measured, they would get credit on their ESG sustainability report for those emissions. So for example, if you have an oil and gas producer that has abandoned a hundred wells in the last year, well, current methods, they don't get any credit for taking uh, those emissions out of the atmosphere because they had bubbles, now they don't have bubbles. But how much emissions did they reduce? There's a lot of abandoned oil and gas wells and there's approximately uh, 170,000 abandoned oil and gas wells in Alberta. This tool will give them the opportunity to get credit, to get even a good ESG story out of what they're doing. By reducing the well heads on the landscape, they are reducing the potential for methane emissions. There's a lot of technologies and a lot of people have spent very large amounts of money detecting methane emissions. So you can do it via satellite or fly over with an airplane or use drones. There's lots of great technology out there that will give you a point in time measurement of your emissions. But what that lacks is the uh, temporal variability. And what that means is in order to do those emissions calculations, you have to add factors such as a wind speed and ambient temperature. It's important to measure the flow across the daytime, the night and day temperature change, because you're gonna get an accurate pressure and temperature reading. There are slight differences with measuring methane in the morning than in the afternoon. With the temperature, everything expands. So with temperature increase, the gas expands, the metal on the, the wellhead expands, and you'll see the pressures higher in the morning than it is in the afternoon. As temperature changes, seasonality changes, especially in Canada, those emission rates can change as well. What happens when I fly over that wellhead today, that emission source today might be very different than what happens next week. You may have caught that emission source, let's call it a tank farm, under construction. Okay, so everything is shut down on that tank farm and therefore there are no emissions on that one day. So the struggle is having a data logger data log over a longer period of time to get you a better picture of what your emissions are doing. The Alberta Energy Regulator uh, mandates quarterly inspections on emissions. Those are four snapshots a year. What's going on in between those snapshots plays a very big role in whether you're getting carbon taxation. And if you're getting taxed on that, you really do need a larger reference point in order to validate those emissions. Before the Paris Accord, there was the Kyoto Accord. And I just don't think industry took greenhouse gas emissions seriously until you know climate events that are happening more recent. As we can see these climate changes, now we're reacting to them. So now technologies will get implemented to help mitigate those emissions. The problem with outdated methods are that they don't have the ability to have less human interaction involved. Like if I can plug in the machine and say, okay, the machine is recording the, the, the volume, the flow, giving you uh, methane concentration, then that's the ability to say, okay, it's an accurate reading, right? As opposed to having somebody 
going measuring the well with one tool coming off the well, coming back later, putting another flow meter on it at a different time. When you have a good standard operating procedure, you, you'll be able to measure precisely and accurately your methane flow. VentMedic is an accurate digital flow meter that has capabilities of very low flow measurement. So with no pressure drop or no differential pressure to rely on, it puts it through a methane sensor to quantify the amount of methane in the gas flow. For example, if your vent is venting 10 cubic meters of gas a day, that's one thing. But to actually know that it's 50% methane means that you're really only venting five cubic meters of methane gas a day. So therefore you should either be taxed or rewarded on making a change on the five cubic meters of methane. When the unit first starts, the gas comes flowing through the inlet and comes in. And the, when, the, when the unit is first on, it's in vent mode, directed out gas. So just in case you have any pressure on the surface casing vent, you can then go and have the pressure bleed off through the vent. Once we're in flow mode, the, the valve changes position to flow and it either goes through gear one, low flow, or gear two, high flow then goes through the methane sensor and out through the flow vent back to the wellhead. Here in the unit inside here is a battery pack and is trickle charged with the solar panel and the three states. First one is flow, vent, and build. It'll help by providing them with the information at a web-based level so they can access that information and they can use that information into their a remediation program to help identify that the well has been remediated. It has the ability to have mistraceable, audible, precise measurements that are capable of providing the most accurate measurements of methane. The tool will not only uh, record the flow rate of gases, but the composition of methane in that flow rate. So therefore you'll be able to convert that to a ton of CO2 equivalent and have a more accurate knowledge of the methane emissions that are being vented to the atmosphere. Having a digital data set is an accountability measurement. If you say you're going to do something, have the data to prove it. If you don't have data to prove that you did anything, should you get credit for it? Should you be punished for it? I'm getting calls from biogas industries, landfill industries, abandoned coal mines, where there is also methane emissions where they are looking at reduction strategies. For an example, a good example would be cattle biogas generation. Large feedstocks have these domes over them and it gathers the methane uh, from the cow's activity inside the, inside the barn. You can use that energy, that methane as a gas to generate electricity. And so this is a good thing. This is a, a very good use for that wasted methane to generate some power. Once you measure that, then those people in the biogas industry, for example, much like the landfill example, they can get credit for what their actual methane they've admitted is. And so in the, in the biogas industry, for example, you have cows that are emitting gases. It's not 100% methane. So the gas that's coming from the biodome into the power generator is not 100% methane. But what percent of it is? that's what that farmer or that industry needs to get credit for. It's not 100% or the cows would be dead. So there's a fluctuating methane concentration in that gas supply to the uh, electrical generator. VentMedic will accurately data log this and effect help that farmer generate those credits more accurately. The challenge is, is how to get somebody to see the value in something when they're not mandated to. I've actually been told that lying is free. So Mike, why bring us your better technology when we can just get away with lying or we can do whatever is the very least, the very cheapest, because that's what the government mandates is antiquated technology. Anybody that is abating methane, or mitigating those methane releases, whether it's through catalytic conversion, flare stacks, vapor recovery units. Their initiatives are great. 
if you added the measurement portion before your mitigation, you would validate your investment. Is it worth it? Is there enough methane there to worry about building or buying a power generation unit and placing it beside a landfill? Well, if we start measuring that, you'll be able to validate your investment. Essentially, you'll, you can target your bad characters. Let's say you have a thousand wells that are scheduled to be abandoned, okay? Some leak, some don't. Some leak lots, some leak a little bit. By doing a study on all of those thousand wells, you can pick your worst characters and go after them and target that first so you get the biggest emission reduction right off the bat. You're not hunting and pecking. Is it worthwhile to spend money abandoning wells that don't emit? Or should you, understanding your data, go after the ones that emit a lot? Measure first, make your decision, build your reduction strategy and execute that strategy to make the biggest impact. This is gonna help remediate the problems that are around. So if there's problems with methane, and we see that there are, you know, this unit's gonna be able to come around and provide repeatable, accurate measurement to go and help the companies alleviate the problem of methane emissions. When an oil company drills a well, they're drilling it for financial gain, that's understood. But what happens over time is the infrastructure, once it gets paid for, gets left behind. If a well site is uneconomic and unusable for the foreseeable future, we see many on the landscape that are there for 20 years, just sitting in the middle of a farmer's field. Why are we waiting to clean that up? That's the net benefit is the land we walk on, the land we call home. Why have all of these unusable assets laying all over the place? Why don't we just clean them up? My dad used to say like, you have to leave this place better than you found it. And so I always kind of come back to thinking, okay, I, if I work in the oil and gas industry, I got to help improve and make better equipment better projects and better facilities so that I can leave this place better than I found it for future generations. I wanted to build something that would actually prove what I was doing because I could lie. I could have lied for 25 years and profited. The call to action for me is as I exit the oil and gas industry as a service provider, I want to leave the industry with a better tool to bring uh, more integrity into what I've been doing for 25 years. So let's all get on the same playing field. Let's all use technology of the 21st century, not the 19th century, so to speak. Why would we do these tests? Why do we spend this money just to not be accountable? That's in essence where uh, the story around the data logging or the integrity around a data set stands is why are you doing it if you're not doing it as best as you can?